Good morning, Eric. Thank you so much for being with us today. To our Daily Planet listeners and, and readers, we have with us today Eric Schwab, the Senior Vice President for Oceans at the Environmental Defense Fund. So let's dive into these questions. Eric, there have been lots of studies documenting the impact of climate change on fish stocks and on oceans more generally. Um, is EDF seeing those impacts in the water, in the fisheries work or ocean work that you're doing in the U.S. and worldwide? Thanks, Monica, and it's great to be here with you. This is an important topic. Yeah, 10 years ago, we began to see this in the Northeast Atlantic, you know, with the mackerel wars, as mackerel began to shift into new waters and became more available in the Faroes and Iceland, and it really upset a sustainable fisheries management regime predominantly centered in Great Britain 10 years ago. More recently and closer to home, we've seen the recruitment failure of Pacific cod in um, the Gulf of Alaska, which has caused unprecedented move of the closure of that fishery uh, by the North Pacific Council. And we've seen for a long time fish stocks on the Atlantic coast moving north and east. Mid-Atlantic species like summer flounder, like black sea bass, are you know, moving north and east and showing up in greater abundance, challenging the management systems that have been in place for a long time there too. And you know, we've seen iconic lobster and sea scallop fisheries that used to be plentiful in places like southern New England that are now severely depleted. And of course, concerns beginning to emerge about around future of the Gulf of Maine lobster and scallop fisheries. Not just EDF, but fishermen and scientists all around the world are seeing this in real time playing out and already challenging management systems. Thanks so much, Eric. And I wanted to follow up on that question and answer that you gave to ask if governments and fisheries managers are taking climate change into account and why or why not? So I think one of the things that we're seeing now is that there is a lot more attention being paid to these challenges. It is necessarily dedicated first to understanding the nature of the changes that are underway. So more focus on science. The management entities are beginning to think about how to apply that science in real world management settings. But we are seeing, you know, fishery management councils around the country, the Mid-Atlantic Council in a collaborative scientific endeavor, trying to really fine tune an understanding of what those managements are, management changes might be, or, or distribution changes might be. We're seeing the Pacific Council undertaking community-based scenario planning. We've seen the new fisheries ecosystem plan for the Bering Sea under the auspices of the North Pacific Council really begin to take seriously some of the changes that are underway. So great signs about attention, still a lot of challenges about what to do about it. So Eric, to go another step on that, what do you think needs to be done? Should fishery management councils start to change their management plans based on these shifting stocks? In the U.S., you know, we regulate by region, and if the fish are shifting out of the regions where they're typically managed, how do we deal with that? We have a number of principles that we've been working to advance at EDF for climate resilient fisheries. Several of those at the outset are having a good basic scientific understanding and a management system that is built on that. So we're fortunate in the U.S that we've got those, those early steps, those boxes checked. The next key principle then focuses on the need to manage for where the fish are going or will be as opposed to where they are. And that's the big challenge that we really got to come face to face with both in the U.S. and elsewhere because we've got allocation systems that are based primarily in, on historic distribution patterns, and they really are not set up to easily adjust to these shifts. We also know that a lot of stocks are gonna cross new jurisdictional boundaries in coming decades. So we need a lot more attention to transboundary agreements that begin to account for the kinds of management relationships that are going to need to be built. And then finally, we don't want to leave out a key principle that is focused on justice and equity and ensuring that the communities across the U.S. and around the world are not unfairly disadvantaged as a result of loss of distribution or productivity off of their shores. You know, we're thinking a lot about kind of the big picture dynamics that have to be put into play in the management systems. Then it just shifts to what are those management systems? What are those techniques you can apply to better account for these shifts? 
throwing a wrench in, in the big picture plan, uh, COVID-19 has hit the fishing sector really hard and fishermen aren't able to fish in many instances and they're struggling to be able to sell their catches. And the government is supposed to be providing assistance to them, but what is happening and is, is there any chance of assistance being used to encourage better fishing practices? Yeah, that's a great question. And the dynamics are different in different places. I think that generally, certainly in the US, while there has been important government assistance in relation to the scale of the impact, most of our fishermen would rightfully suggest that not enough support has been provided. It's interesting to draw the comparison between the impacts of short-term disruptions associated with COVID and the longer-term disruptions that we are seeing and will see more of in relation to climate. So some of the same kinds of resiliencies are going to have to be applied. We're seeing that now in responding to COVID. We're seeing markets being disrupted. We're seeing, you know, what is historically long and complicated trade relationships that have just been severed. And fishermen and and other parts of the fishing industry really sort of sort of trying to shorten market relationships, develop new, more localized markets and the like in ways that are, I think, going to be really important for us in the long run as well. Eric, one last question for you. Electronic monitoring, new technology is making it possible for fisheries to be much better managed. Do you think fishermen will begin to accept and embrace this new technology? Yes, Monica. I think that, first of all, there was movement in that direction anyway. I think the experiences of COVID have really put a lot more fishermen in a position of appreciating the value of technology as an alternative to at-sea observers. We also like to think, by the way, that this technology that is available to fishermen isn't just for compliance monitoring. You know, these are tools that can help fishermen in their business operations as well. So I think there's definitely going to be some additional movement toward electronic monitoring and related capacities as we go forward. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you again for taking the time with us today. And we really appreciate your being a friend of the planet. Thank you.